Hey everyone, this is Dragon Rider. When I'm not talking about video games with my husband in our podcast, Pass Play Gaming, or giving you a rundown of the Hearthstone meta in just a few minutes on YouTube, you can probably find me posting something on Twitter at DonnyDK. But right now, please join me in getting your accessible deep dive into the competitive side of Hearthstone while we listen to Coin Concede. Greetings. Hello. Greet my greetings. Well met. I greet you. Greetings, traveler. Greetings, friend. The pleasure is mine. Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to episode 152 of Coin Concede, a Hearthstone podcast dedicated to making the competitive side of the game more accessible to you. From the Maelstrom, Louisiana, it's me, Appa. Joining us from Gadsden, New York, it's Ridiculous Hat. How you doing, Hat? It sure is. I'm okay. It's, uh... So, it's September now, and it is... It was 91 degrees Fahrenheit today. And it is currently 86% humidity. So I was surprised that summer hasn't ended, but I have water next to me, so I'm keeping hydrated. Well, I'm glad you're staying hydrated at least. Yeah, it's it's really, really hot down in Louisiana too. I'm so ready for the summer to be over. I'm already so deep into like wanting it to be the fall that we baked halloween cupcakes two days ago oh uh, you're one of them when did you have your first pumpkin spice latte i haven't had it yet oh do you know i looked that up they have 50 grams of sugar in a medium i don't want to think about it it's i just want to it actually taste is delicious pumpkin it has spice. More don't, <laughs> don't look at sugar contents of anything okay but just it, it'll just make you upset but a pumpkin Every spice latte see... a pumpkin spice latte has more sugar than a bag of skittles I looked it up. A bag of Skittles has less sugar than a beverage they sell at Starbucks for adults. Have you ever okay. seen how much sugar is in cereal? I used to eat a lot of cereal, and it wasn't even the the ones that are very obvious about how sugary they are, like Fruit Loops and Frosted Flakes and those ones that are just pure sugar. Even the boring ones have so much sugar in them, and You're it's just really like- upsetting because I love <laughs> I love like Cracklin' Oat Bran. You, you would think that'd be a, a fr- fairly healthy cereal. Nope, nope, no, just infinite sugar. Really? really is sad. does cheese have sugar? Uh, no. Okay, that's why I eat a lot of cheese. Sa- that's that's not why, but it's a good reason to eat a lot of cheese. <laughs> it's a justification for my gross intake of cheese. <laughs> I'm, it's, okay, first of all, there's nothing gross about eating cheese, and second of all, it needs no justification <laughs> no, no. other than I mean, it tastes like, great. Like. Total amount, like gross. That's, I'm listen. My dinner has been the the bag of deli slices that's gonna go bad tomorrow. I'd say more times than I'm than I care to admit, but I'm admitting it right now, and I care about cheese. If, if they're gonna go bad, you know what you got to do. It's we're going off the rails. Hoppa, take take the show back from me. Take it. <laughs> Man, I was having fun going down the little side path. So, also joining us from Carazan, California, it's Bodicus. How are you and your cheesy lifestyle doing? Great. I, I had a lot of cheese for dinner, and, and it was delicious, as as always. Bodicus, can we, can we edit in? Can you say your answer to that question be pretty gouda? No. Can you say it's that? Not gonna <laughs> <do it> for <laughs> I'm sorry. Are, are you saying that you have already answered that question? Have already is a type of cheese. <laughs> you not? You're not. <laughs> Let's how, just how can I take the show back when you just derail it with these? It's, I lack self control. I'm muting. <laughs> the, the, the old hat mute. Continue. Um, I forgot what I was going to ask. I had a funny joke lined up. Well, at least it was funny to me, and then I forgot it, so it must have not been that funny. Anyways, Coin Concede is supported in large part by you, the listener. If you'd like to find out how you can support us and receive rewards in return, head on over to patreon.com slash coinconcede. And so so I'm not going to have this just be a ladder section. I feel like every week I'm like, how'd y'all do on ladder? And then we just kind of discuss our general lives at the same time. So how was y'all's last week? Mine was good. I uh, 
as I said, I was going to, I had jury duty on Friday and not much access to good internet. And I didn't realize how bad the internet was going to be, but uh, was not able to play actual ladder games, played a little bit of casual, also tried to work on that last puzzle quest, puzzle lab quest thing that I had left and what did not get there. I put a lot of time into the uh, Defile one and haven't figured it out. But I also played a little bit yesterday and got punished for uh, taking as much time off as I did uh, by queuing Quest Rogue into Mana Worm, uh, Coin Mana Worm, and then uh, Odd Paladin into Quest Priest with Double Lash, Double Dustbreaker, Double Primordial Drake. And I know it had all of those because it all got played on me before they had drawn 15 cards. And that was tilting. But the most tilting loss was I lost as Quest Rogue versus an Odd Warrior. And uh, basically what happened is I was a little late to finish the quest, which usually isn't a bad thing. And I was kind of doing my thing. I had I had to use a Zola early, so I couldn't go infinite that way. But I was going infinite with uh, Giggling Inventor, Brewmaster, the Giggling Inventor, Brew- uh, Shadow Reflection, Brewmaster, the Brewmaster. And it's very similarly as good. But then I got azelina and the Azelina got my Sonya and then hid the Sonya behind two giggling inventors and i could never I, I, they just had too many things and i eventually fatigued out uh so that that was unfortunate that's gross <laughs> yeah it, it was not the most fun experience i definitely think i could have played the game better as well as the warrior won multiple or won both of his brawls with one minion and i had three or four every time uh, but definitely could have played better. Also could have hand tracked a little better because I should have known that he got an extra, not blade flurry, what it reckless, an extra re- reckless flurry off of a mimic pod. And that kind of blew me out. Uh, That's the first time I've ever heard that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so uh, play good against Quest Warrior. I was expecting him to concede on turn one when I played the quest, and they they beat me, which will happen if you don't play very well. But yeah, that was that's my week. Played a bit of Quest Rogue. Played a bit of Odd Mech Paladin. It was, played it was played good. a lot of WoW. Yeah, more more WoW than either of those things. <laughs> So how was your, well, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll go with mine because I don't have really any interesting stories or anything. I got up to rank 15 on Asia from 25 with free to play zoo. Rank four, or I got up to rank four on NA. I'm a rank five right now playing like Shutterwalk Shaman and tinker around with odd warrior builds. I'm playing right now. I'm testing an odd quest warrior deck with shield bearers. And it's just like, all about turboing out the quest against the slow decks and then against the fast decks you're just odd warrior so i've been having pretty solid games with that i've had a few unfortunate losses but it feels good and then i hit rank five on eu with odd rogue hit slash miracle rogue what, what do you mean slash oh both decks yes yeah does your miracle rogue deck have elephants no it doesn't. It has questing adventures. Yeah, it, it's it's Appa. We already we already know he's questing. I, I had to ask questions. I already knew the answer to. <laughs> so, how was your week, Hat? Um, this is the time of year actually where I start to get into more tournament play than ladder play. I am in THL and UHL. So UHL is starting next week. Uh, THL. We just finished week one. Uh, we won our first week, which is very exciting. Uh, it took, I think, four of our five matches, and I had pretty fortunate uh, matchups against uh, a good guy, Ironfire, over there, and we actually had picked the same lineup. We both figure out Druid does too many things, so you got to ban it, and then play things that beat Quest Rogue. So wasn't Quest Rogue. We both went triple aggro, and uh, I managed to get the more fortunate draws, including a really gross uh, turn one, Flame and Voidwalker, turn two, Double Librarian, turn three... Enchanter Ghoul, turn four, Sarah Knight, turn five, Dreadlord, play, and then Solarium into three cards I could play. 
it was good, and I won that game against Odro despite being really unfavored. That's the descriptor you want to use there. It was good. It was good. I, you know what? If I could, if I could do it again, I would. I would do that. I would well, try you, to do you, that you, every you, game ever that I played ever, and yeah. then get you. Legend. You are the guy that I saw go. Coin Kelso Shadow Step Shadow Step against some poor dude. Uh, yes. And so I guess you're used to a higher class of RNG than the I rest mean, okay. Of I don't want to paint <laughs> I don't want to paint the picture that was every game because also on stream this week, I did a thing that I probably shouldn't admit to, but I did it. So I was playing Macathoon Boomship Warrior, which is a really fun deck. I've been playing a good amount of it. And I was playing it on stream, and it was the newest build and the one Fibonacci hit top one hundred with, and I'm like, this feels really good. And I matched up against Odd Warrior, which you basically can't lose. And then I get to zero cards in deck, and the last cards in my hand are Boomship, Mechathune, Maligos, Dynomatic, and Double Inner Rage. And I go to do the combo, and they said, did I use Whirlwind to proc Battle Rage? And then I sat there for a while, and then I got silenced on my Mechathune, and then I took my headphones off, and uh, and I I... Didn't play any more games on stream after that. So, I want to point out, it's not just about RNG. Mostly not. I've got my fair share of bad draws, but most importantly, I am almost certainly the worst thing that ever happens to me in any game I play. Yep, that is so true for so many people. Yep. Yeah. Especially me as well. Yeah. Like, I am almost always the biggest reason why I uh, I get low rolled, because I'm stuck with me. Um... But as far as what I've been playing <laughs> post reset, it's been mostly I've been trying Braggy's uh, B R A G I Brag Brahi I don't know I've been trying his Secret Hunter, which is not it only plays six secrets, doesn't play Subject Nine, plays two Venom Strike, uh, two Snake, and two Explosive, and that's it. And it's a mid range aggro deck. You play Secret Keepers and Dire Moles. You got Bear Sharks. You got Scavenging Hyena and Unleash the Hounds, which is great right now. It feasts on Token Druid. It goes really really fast. Um, and then I've also been trying Even Shaman, which has been surprisingly good. That deck's really resilient right now. And for some reason, there's still not a lot of Defiles around. And, uh, you know, as much as I love Subject 9, I like decks that kill people in the face fast. So I'm not sure if the 5 mana draw a bunch more cards is necessary if you're just going a little bit faster. Because that deck tops out at uh, Rexar and 2 Spellstones and everything else is 4 or less. You just play Hunter. And it's pretty good. But I've also really enjoyed Even Shaman. It's not really all that exciting. It does play uh, the uh, Menacing Nimbus, the 2 mana 2 2 elemental that draws you another elemental. But otherwise, you really go bigger with that deck than I remember. There's a lot of Sea Giants and Kalamos and Alakir and the Lich King and Fire Elementals and just big stuff. I seem to remember distinctly people saying on Twitter Menacing Nimbus was garbage. And that card has been awesome for me I've every really time I've played it. it. Yeah, I've liked it a lot. Like, the card doesn't always matter a ton, but it's better than not having a card, and usually your early investment is just to bait the board clear. So it's just, I'd rather have that over a turn two knife juggler in a lot of matchups, because they kill the board anyways. Instead of one damage to your face, I get a random elemental that might be a golden alloc here that totally hits my last opponent in the face for six. It, it Are you all... playing the elemental, like, top end? Uh, it plays... You said Kalamos, right? Kalamos is yeah. there. Uh, Corpse Taker is there. No Hagatha. Uh, oh, okay. This sounds yeah. similar to what I was playing. But yes, Sea Giant. Hagatha. Yeah. Okay. How does... How do either of these decks do versus Odd Warrior? Uh, Odd Warrior is... I think Even Shaman does better than you might think it does. Because... I think it's, like, 40-ish. It Even plays Shaman. a lot of big stuff, and, and Odd yeah. Warrior isn't as great at dealing with sequential big things as I thought it would be, as long as you play around Super Collider. But their skills, their their tools in that deck are not really designed to deal with 8-8 eight, eight into 8-8 eight, eight into 7-7, seven, seven, etc. They're, they're designed to deal with about four wide boards and about two really big threats, and then more big threats if you, if you play them next to each other physically on the board. And that's about it. But Sea Giants can't be silenced, and after those Shield Slums are gone, they hit for 8. So, I think okay. that matchup yeah. is actually my, my not terrible. Yeah, my experience is the matchup is tricky, and it definitely feels unfavored because you have to have like really strong draw to like power through multiple board clears. But I think it probably evens out to around like forty sixty, like sixty in the Warriors' favor. Yeah, the shaman like evens even out 
really frequently, actually, about every game. Uh, <laughs> uh, I always, I keep thinking to myself that I want to try playing some Odd Warrior, and every time I think about it, I watch somebody on stream queue Odd Warrior into an Odd Warrior, and I just go to the next stream. I'm just yeah. not, I'm, that's not a useful use of my time. I'm, that's what you I'm take. just not going to do that to myself. This one man a card that wins that matchup single-handedly. It's called the quest. It's, oh, so I was going to say I was going to say the caverns below, but also Fire Plume Heart is pretty good. Yes. That's Both that's what those. I put. That, that's why I've been playing the yeah, quest version of Warrior like Oh, Warrior. Zelay's version. Yeah, yeah. And does do you play the list with no Dr. Boom? Cuz he doesn't play Dr. Boom. Oh, no. I'm not playing his version. I top out at 5. Oh. I'm playing double shield bears. Oh, you're playing actual taunt warrior. Not not yeah. Baku. No, I'm I'm playing Baku. <laughs> oh, wait. So you don't you top out at Baku. Cost nine. Oh my god. Uh, it's a it's a card in your deck. Hold on. That's yes, not me being yes. smart. That's a card in your deck. <laughs> no, I know. I'm saying, oh my god, because like I just don't even think about that as a card in my deck. <laughs> For it's, me, the curve stopped at five with Zilliax. <laughs> It's, well, yeah, I mean, because if you're playing it correctly, then Baku is always the third, 30th card in your deck. Yes. Yeah, but yes, I top out at nine. Deck. <laughs> okay. Top out at, at five, except for Baku. Yeah. 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 yeah my, I, I built my deck to be like really focused on turboing out the quest as fast as possible whenever my opponent doesn't play a one drop. Yeah, that makes sense. And Phantom Militia and Stonehill are really, really good at that. Yeah. I was playing Wax Elemental at first, and I got Blood Knighted. I was oh. like, oh, these are coming out. Oh, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I, I went Wax Elemental, Wax Elemental, complete the oh, quest, God. and then he went Blood Knight, and I was like, okay, I'm just dead to this Blood Knight now. <laughs> it's, you have a quest, and he has a 9-9. Nine -nine. And, and a you don't have execute. You don't have execute. No. And uh, also, your hero power only hits for eight, so it survives two of them. I would consider a large game hunter. Yeah, but but I took those. I took the waxy boys out. <laughs> Shield yeah. bears went in. Uh, Wait, what a so weird you, universe where there's a play, one mana taunt meta. You still play giggling, right? It's just that no. good that you have. You don't play giggling. Wow. Mm -mm. All right. Really. I mean, I don't know if it's optimal. That's just where I'm at right now. <laughs> okay, it's, I mean, it's yeah, it's, you can't be like, well, no, it's uh, I do now. I went back in time and added giggling. Then it's just, it's not okay, what look, I'm expecting. My rationale was whenever I play giggling, my quest doesn't tick up by one. Okay. So yeah, you, I mean, that, I, so I you get typed it, in the word also... taunt into your collection and you just started <laughs> jamming buttons until the deck I is didn't full. I did technically type taunt, but I skimmed and my, I mentally typed taunt. <laughs> okay, what I think I'm going to do now is we're I'm going to go into the into the collection after the show, add Baku first, then type taunt, and every card that's still up there, we're going sequential. We're going <laughs> in order, starting with the warrior tab. And when I hit five mana, I'm switching over to neutral, then we'll come back. Turbo taunt. Are, are, we, re are we really doing this right now? At, there's are nothing else to talk plenty? about this week. Like, this is this is how metas are broken, Buck. <laughs> this is how podcasts are broken. How podcasters are broken. We made cheese puns, and now we're going in order in our taunt decks. <laughs> I'm writing down the episode title is "Sequential Taunts." That's gonna that's gonna be the title of the episode. Just oh, every no. game, you're just playing odd curve taunt warrior. <laughs> One hero power three, hero power five, <laughs> hero power five. Uh, right. No, no, in this deck, it's got to be a uh, taunt minion, hero power, taunt minion, and then no, double no. taunt on turn four, right? You double That'd taunt on goal. two. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot about turn two. <laughs> no, it's it's turn one, quest coin shield bearer, turn two, shield bearer waxy. <laughs> We're just coining out the O4? Uh, it's listen you have to skip that a turn is, at some that point is, that is suspect that you're skipping so a turn bad. at some point and the coin differential in the sequential taunt warrior mirror is probably pretty poor just get it out there just get it out naturalize will not overfill your hand <laughs> playing around naturalize boys yeah it's turn one that's the plan right away because that's how you win the druid matchup <laughs> 
Shield bearer on one. Note for anyone listening that's unfamiliar with the matchup, please do not coin out shield bearer on turn one. <laughs> this has been coin concede. The, the, the classic turbo taunt on warrior matchup. <laughs> I know what I'm bringing to UHL week one. Week one, UHL opponent. Audrey Kills, if you, if you ever listen to this episode, get yourself ready for taunts in order. <laughs> Oh my oh, god. Man. This show, this podcast is officially just we're we're so far off. We're going backwards now. Yeah. <laughs> Giggling we, podcast. Should we do some that news? Would, that would know. be the great. <laughs> it's all downhill from here. Name. The question is just where do we end up? <laughs> all right. Somebody take news from me. Just take this. All right, so it's a light news week this week, but we have a couple couple things here that we wanted to talk about. Uh, there is a new Chinese Hearthstone app that reads previous stats for your month uh, in client or from your game data and gives you some very useful information. Uh, so there was a tweet by the Twitter account Celestial Sin. And it gives some pretty cool screenshots of of things that they have in China now. It basically kind of shows your progress over the course of of the month. It has a bunch of days and shows at, uh, when you were at what rank. And then it also has a screenshot of a what looks like a recently played. the The whole thing is in Chinese, so unfortunately, I can't read it. But it looks like it gives a very similar feel to kind of what Hearthstone Deck Tracker uh, gives you in terms of previous matches, of who you played against, uh, and all that kind of stuff. And it looks like this is a pretty decent overall replacement just for Hearthstone Deck Tracker almost seems like it doesn't need to be used anymore um, in China. I mean, what what do you guys think about this? The, the only thing I don't see is if they have... I, I don't remember if... They already have something that tracks your that does a deck tracker for China as well, or if they still need that. But in terms of statistics and stuff like that, this is all pretty cool information. Uh, I'll start with Appa. What do you ha, have? You seen uh, seen these screenshots? It looks pretty cool. Uh, I saw a few screenshots. Does it just track your stats, or does it track like the deck and everything too? Uh, it, you know what I mean? Like Deck Tracker has the overlay feature where it tracks everything. I didn't know if it this did that as well. It, it reads your stats of your past games directly from your game account, and then it looks like it spits out your previous decks. I don't know if there's ways to click and see what cards you were playing in that deck exactly. Um, I, I don't know how much how much actual information is on here because. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah. well. Either way, it seems really cool. I'm glad yeah. they're starting to integrate integrate these kind of things when we've been using third party for so long. I'd really love to see a lot of these third party apps and basically just anything third party just be integrated into Hearthstone's client eventually. Would be be ideal. Yeah, it's so. This is the Hearthstone in China has a lot of ups and downs because the game is run by a separate company. Blizzard licenses it to NetEase, and NetEase does all the infrastructure administration inside China. And thanks to the Chinese laws, there's a lot of interesting different things. Like, you don't buy packs. You buy a single unit of dust, and it comes with a pack because you can't sell loot boxes, so they sell dust. It's, you know, you get a pack with every order of dust, so, you know, kind of working around the system there, but... Along with the kind of closed tournaments that sometimes we only hear about that don't get casted. And there's been some drama lately that's been unconfirmed about Jason Joe and Biza that we don't know enough to comment on. But apparently Jason Joe has actually retired from the scene. He believes it was an issue with the with the tournaments there and him not being allowed to play in them. But we don't want to comment too much on it because we don't know. But it just goes to show the complexities of this is kind of an isolated bubble where... A separate company deals with all the administration in ways we never hear about, and this is one of the things to make it out where 
these features are built into the game by a company that is not quite first party, not quite third party, kind of in the middle, right? They, they're doing things that Blizzard wouldn't do, but they have control over Blizzard's game. And it looks an awful lot like these are the things that we wish the client could do that we depend on third party software that Blizzard doesn't support. I really wish that we had access to this sort of thing and that we had more clarity as well on why this gets to happen there and why these features can't make it over to the other markets and why Blizzard can't license this from NetEase. Yeah. Um, I kind of wish that this was uh, coming to us here just on all the other servers, but uh, it, I seriously doubt that this is anywhere near uh, our future. It, I, I just, uh, you know, it's not so, it doesn't look like something that we're going to be getting anytime soon. But if we do, then I'll be really excited about seeing uh, how, how it could be implemented over here. Uh, the next little news item we have here is a Reddit post about divorcing statistics and competitive Hearthstone. So this is a fairly interesting article. Um, it has a couple, I think, fer fairly useful topics in there. Uh, it goes into some of the traps that people get into when trying to interpret data. Um, it uses uh, a lot of examples from uh, calling or talking about vicious syndicate and saying that you uh, should not try to uh, equate win percentage with the strength of a deck. Uh, that played win rate does not necessarily equal worth uh, whether a card is worthy of inclusion in a deck, and that win percentage does not account for familiarity with the decks. But unfortunately, the post always, or the post seems to kind of assume some things that uh, that most, it kind of assumes that the readers are already taking, or that most of the people looking at this data are interpreting it at face value, just saying essentially that um, whatever the win percentage that Vicious Syndicate says a deck is, that's what it actually is. Um, and that it also kind of says that uh, you're assuming that single game win rates should align with statistical aggregate win rates. That's very obviously a hat sentence because I could barely even say it. But uh, um, the last little note here is that, uh, oh, I was just going to say, it also said to search for topics on Bing. I didn't realize <laughs> Bing was an actual search engine people used. That's like, <laughs> look up Vicious Syndicate on askjeeves.com. <laughs> anyway, I, I kind of kid with that last one, but... Uh, I, we all thought it was a fairly interesting discussion topic, at least. So uh, I know the person most passionate about this was, was Hat, since obviously you uh, are somewhat tied to Vicious Syndicate. And um, it the post kind of takes Vicious Syndicate in what I would say is a negative light, and I think that's unfounded. But uh, maybe you can kind of uh, explain uh, explain a little bit better about what what we can take away from this post. Okay, so I should, full disclosure, I write for Vicious Syndicate every single week, and I have for quite some time, and I have a an extensive relationship with them as a business platform. I've written for them for two years now. So my goal here is to make sure I express myself in an even-handed way that's not based on my relationship, but rather based on my knowledge gained from that. And also, I want to point out, I'm going to have probably a different conclusion than people might think. I do think there needs to be some understanding across the Hearthstone community, and I've brought this up a couple times, about using data responsibly and understanding data. Because a lot of the assumptions that people make about statistics in general, this writer accurately identifies, but unfairly paints them as the fault of Vicious Syndicate, uses poor examples to illustrate that, and makes unfounded assumptions about how the operation of the data reaper is the most important thing at, that he brings up is that played win rate is terrible as a statistic and i agree with that 100 percent played win rate 
which is the win rate your deck has when you play a card, is innately a stat that demands context and is provided without it. Ultimate Infestation, extremely high played win rate. You know why? Because if you get to 10 mana and you play it, you probably win the game. Yeah, there's... I think there's two cards we can kind of use to really emphasize this. And I don't know what Quest Rogue's global win rate is, but let's say it's like 53% or something. So the played win rate for the quest is going to be 53%, right? Yes. And as opposed well, probably to probably higher, <laughs> right? Because it's got to equate for all the times where you don't play quest. Oh, no, no, you're right. Sorry. It's, it's, if you don't play the quest, then yes, the quest will have a higher yeah. win rate than not playing it. It's not a useful statistic, but it's true. <laughs> Anyways, that as opposed to Bloodlust, which probably has a 70 plus percent win rate, because when you're casting Bloodlust, they're dying. You know, but but that doesn't do anything for the majority of the game. It's just your hand dead. So played win rate is the most context intensive stat that I could probably okay. possibly. So the the highest played win rate cards, the top five are Ticking Abomination is number one. <laughs> Coffin Crasher, Blood Bloom, Shutterwalk, Mind Blast. OK, so Ticking Abomination is the highest played win rate card in the game right now. It wins the game 87.8% of the time that it is played. Only that? Only okay, 87? Well, so that means the games were, were... So for those that don't know, in Mechathune Priest, the combo is... 13% of players are messing up. 22.3%, or 22.2%, if I did my math right. Yeah. Uh, so, or no, 12, no, I didn't do my math. I'm editing that. So... <laughs> I was off by 10. So the point. So for those that don't know, I'm marking this again. I'm going to wait for Bodica to stop laughing. Patrons, boy, I hope that you're not listening to this somewhere public because I apologize for people that hear our giggles. So Taking Abomination is part of the combo of the Mechathune Priest where you play Lab or Reckless Experimenter, which is the 5-mana 4-6 Priest card. It reduces your death rattles cost by 3, and it makes them die the turn you play them. So you play that, you play two Ticking Abominations, which deal five to your board when they die. You play Coffin Crasher, which when it dies, it puts out uh, Mechathune, drops Mechathune into play. And so you play Coffin Crasher first, two Ticking Abominations. The Coffin Crasher dies, the Mechathune plops into the board, then both Ticking Abominations die, ten to your entire board. And it, it clears the board when you have an empty hand, an empty deck, and you win the game because Mechathune goes off. So... The only time you're playing Ticking Abomination is supposed to be part of that combo. There are times where you will play it on turn four or early because you are dying. You're not going to get to the combo because you're Mechathune Priest. And you don't really do anything until the combo. Just try and survive. And you have to compete on board even if it means giving up the combo. There are other times where you play it and you mess up the combo. You play the Coffin Crasher second or third. Or you have a card left in your deck. Or something. But usually, you play it when you play the combo that wins you the game. But you don't see us going around and adding Ticking Abomination to our decks. Because the context of this is, it is a combo enabler. The after Blood Bloom, which is the Mechathune combo enabler. After Shutterwalk, which is pretty obviously part of Shutterwalk Shaman. And the thing that HS Replay also does, which is the site I'm looking at, they count each instance of Shutterwalk as a separate copy. So when you're playing 100 Shutterwalks in the game, they are all contributing to played win rate. I should point out, times played. Taking Abomination has been played 530,000 times. Shutterwalk, 1.1 million. Because each instance is its own Shutterwalk. So again... That's a lot of jaws and claws, Statistics fam. are telling you a different story than you think you're getting, and you have to do what we're doing right now to look into it. Now, played win rate, not super useful, because the deck win rate of Taking Abomination is 50.6%. It's not... An accurate statistic, right? The win rate of Reckless Experimenter. The win rate of that deck is 49.1%, but it has a 68.2% played win rate. There's a lot of information here, but the information isn't, isn't answering your question, isn't telling the story you think it's telling. And what this post is trying to do misguidedly is saying, stop taking the numbers at face value and sorting by played win rate and taking the bottom card out of your deck. Because that's what people were doing for a while, and they still fall into that trap, but it's not what played win rate is telling you. What played win rate is telling you is 
It's the ending of the story. It's the last sentence of the story, but you need to know everything that came before it. Yeah, this, the entire post really just struck me and was written in a way that it tried to vilify statistics first. Right. And then the second half was just because of my anecdotes, basically. Well, and also a bunch of bunch of anecdotes. He crap. So Vicious Syndicate is mentioned by name in this post six times. And the problem here is that he talks about the problems with played win rate and then says Vicious Syndicate uses that when Zach O, who is the editor of the Vicious Syndicate Report, is the biggest detractor of the played win rate statistic you will find anywhere, does not use it in any of the information that we gather, and tells people the best thing to do with this statistic is not use it. Mike Danaeus on Reddit has said we don't use played win rate. Zach O says don't use played win rate ever. And this post is talking about the flaws of played win rate, which is only visible on HS Replay. But he mentions Vicious Syndicate by name six times with incorrect information about how it works. Looking. That part really stands out to me as he's got some kind of agenda or axe to grind here. I don't know if he's trying to knock down the most popular report because this is also a person that specifically said, I search for things on Bing. So I don't know if he's just trying to look for <laughs> the second most popular thing and try and say the most popular thing doesn't matter. But it seems like he's going out of his way to advertise that he's different. Oh, no. I'm just saying. No, got me. I'm just saying. I was, was going to meme about how he said he did some digging. But <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to really needle this dude too hard. Because I, no. I do understand where he's, he's coming right from. He's right that people I, are misusing statistics. That's a correct thing to say. But how we yeah. went about explaining it and the assumptions he made to back up what he was trying to prove were were blatantly incorrect. So I agree with the main purpose here, but it was executed very, very poorly. Yeah, it was. It, it had some fallacies in there. And then the fact that it was really poking at Vicious Syndicate is what brought it to my attention because Zacho was just ranting on Twitter about it. And I was like, ooh, let's see what this is about. But yeah, that was a that was an interesting post that came up over this past week. Do we have anything else for the news or is it just like a desert over here in Newsland? Yeah, it's been pretty light now that the expansion's been out for a while, but uh, probably have some some more stuff coming up in the near future. I would I would expect we got BlizzCon coming up, so there's probably going to be some hype around around that, and th th there will be things coming up, but just kind of a light news week. So I guess we should go into tournaments then. Yes, let's do that. Uh, you can hear me. Yes, let's do that. I mean, I don't mean to harp on the statistics things a lot, but yes, let's talk about tournaments. It's the grand tournament. So while it is not very lively in Newsland, tournament land has so much going on. So much going on. Got three tournaments this week and two tournaments next week. Or no, three tournaments next week, too. We've got three tournaments this week and next week. Two of the ones this week were more like show matches. But it was a really interesting week because this is the start of the HCTEU playoffs season two. We have a cut to top eight, double elimination tournament, and Renman and Moyen ended up going 2-0. and oh. Hatul and Sintalal ended up going 2-1. and one. They punched their ticket. Mikalop and Silvors were 1-2, and two, and Vardu and Hunter Race went 0-2. Oh, Hunter Race, top eight, obviously amazing, but a little bit less than, than we've seen from him this year. Now, keep in mind, what, six top fours, something crazy like that, two wins. He's on an absolute tear. He's really lined up for qualification for every tournament there is, but he did not make the top four cut to Worlds here. He was one match away from that. So, unfortunately, he didn't make it, but really stacked top eight. We had the Hearthstone Showdown, which was a 16-player tournament. Over at uh, PAX West, the Geico Hearthstone Showdown, our friend Avantis over at Hero Power is one of the tournament admins there. And there was an open bracket that fed eight people into a eight versus eight playoff against invited pros. The top four had Terrence M over Just Saying, and I've tried to read this bracket, but I messed up a couple times as to where that ended up. 
Now, the top four of the winner's bracket was Terrence M over Kibler and Just Saiyan over Hotmouth. But then both those players that got knocked down, uh, Hotmouth lost to Yoitslow and Kibler lost to Narit. Narit lost to Yoitslow in the loser's bracket. Yoitslow worked his way back up and played against Terrence M in the grand final and then lost. And Terrence M took it, but it is second time in a row that Yoitslow has made the finals of a Geico showdown. He made the one last at PAX East, and he made this one at PAX West. Two different coasts, two different PAXs, same guy, same placement. Pretty cool. HEG is still going on. Week 5 has finished. Week 6 is underway. It is the last week of group play. Brazil remains undefeated. We've also got China, Taiwan, Chile, Singapore, the Ukraine, Switzerland, UK, Bulgaria, with four wins, one loss. I think they are locked to make the round of 16. And then these teams are fighting for their life. They need to win this week if they want to make it to the the elimination rounds. New Zealand, Hong Kong, Norway, Germany, Spain, Poland, Czech Republic, South Korea, Netherlands, Portugal, the U.S., Belgium, and Canada. Now, as far as statistics go, we're going to talk about the HCTEU primarily because we have stats for the entire tournament. And big props to our friend Steve Wickedgood for the incredible dashboard he's put together over on Off Curve of all the different tournament decks that we have compiled to see the breakdown of archetypes. We have every single deck in the tournament broken down by percentages. There were 82 druids, by far the most popular class, 29 tokens, 21 mali druids, 12 tog waggles, 11 taunts, 7 bigs, 2 spitefuls. We had 67 rogues, 32 odd, 30 quests, 4 Miracle, 1 King's Bane. We had 63 Warlocks, 31 Zeus, 24 Evens, 5 Cubes, 3 Controls. We had 51 Hunters, 44 Recruit, 4 Spells, 3 Secret. We had 33 Shamans, 31 Shutterwalks, and 2 Brave Souls playing even. We had 23 Paladins, 22 were odd, 1 Control. 13 Warriors, 12 odd, 1 Control. 12 Mages, 7 Tempo, 5 Big. And 4 Lonely Priests, one that was, er, 2 Control, 1 Lyra, and 1 West. Now, when we cut to the top eight, it looks similar. Eight druids made it. Three token, three mally, one tog waggle, one big. Seven hunters, so seven out of eight. Five cube, one spell, one secret. Five rogues, three were quest, two were odd. Five warlocks, three were zoo, one even, one cube. Three shamans. Two shutter rocks, one mid range. Two odd warriors, one tempo mage, one control priest. Zero paladins. Now, our top four, the two and zero oh winners. The people that won out their groups to, to punch their tickets. Mally Druid, Recruit Hunter, Quest Rogue, and Q-Block was the lineup that Renmen brought, and he very much was interested in beating Control. You look at that lineup, he does not want to lose to Control ever. Quest Rogue and Q-Block stick out like a sore thumb. That's saying if I get queued up against Control, I beat them. Moyen, the other 2-0 and o player, Token Druid, Secret Hunter, Odd Rogue, and Zulok. He wants to beat Combo. And probably a lot of aggro decks, actually, because he's going to out-aggro them. And maybe sometimes Control, if he can. If he can get pressure going, Token Druid actually does pretty well. Now, the 2-1 players, Sintalal had a very similar lineup. He took out that uh, Secret Hunter had a Tempo Mage, Token Druid, Tempo Mage, Odd Rogue, and Zulok. And Hatul had Togwaggle Druid, Spell Hunter, Control Priest, and Odd Warrior. He was the hard control, did not want to lose to Aggro. And also, he beats Control a good amount of the time with the Mind Blast Priest and the Togwaggle Druid. So, really interesting, multiple different takes on how you can approach a format. When we look at the Hearthstone Showdown, we do just want to go over the final decks. It was definitely a very different kind of tournament. Again, 16 players, 8 invited. I think the meta is going to be a little bit less serious. Not quite the same as the global games, where the actual competitiveness is almost entirely locked behind that bizarre queuing system. But Terrence won the tournament with Token Druid, Odd Paladin, Odd Rogue, and Zoo Warlock. Just go face. All he wants to do is go face. And Yo It's Slow made it to the finals with Taunt Druid, Cube Hunter, Shutterwalk Shaman, and Rin Even Warlock but could not take down the hyper-aggressive lineup. We do have a game to watch. Hunter Ace actually had a really interesting bunch of games this tournament, and the matching in the highlight is his against Sintalal. There were a lot of really, really great things in this entire match. But I want to talk about Game 1, because Sintalal was playing Zoo, and Hunter Ace was playing Shutterwalk, and kind of shows how difficult it is to navigate these turns and end up with an aggressive deck making the right decisions or in Sintalal's case, some of the wrong decisions that really changed how this game flowed. Now, turn one Flame Imp from a zoo. 
about the best opening you can get, and since Law was on the coin. And Hunter Ace's turn two. Double Earth Shock it. Which I really didn't expect to see, but there's a lot of respect for that early damage, about slowing the game down. About finding a way, turn one Flame Imp, no coin, no double one drop, no additional pressure immediately behind it. And those Earth Shocks are likely not going to get better value than just saving three damage right there and potentially six, nine, twelve damage building up. And it leads to Sinsalol having a weak turn, which Hunter Race correctly predicted. It's Happy Ghoul and Soul Infusion, or uh, Light Warden and Soul Infusion, which ends up hitting a Happy Ghoul. That's not really what you want to be hitting with Soul Infusion. It's fine. And Serenite comes down on three, and Hunter Race rolls a Healing Totem into a Light Warden, but Manatide comes down on three for Hunter Race. And Sintalal makes the active choice not to kill it. Just develops, but does not kill it. Just goes face. He actually trades the following turn a Light Warden, a 3-2 Light Warden, into Keliseth to protect Serenite and Flame Imp and the 5-5 Happy Ghoul. To protect his minions, to prevent Lightning Storm from softening up his board and getting that guaranteed clear is really interesting. And it works out, kinda. The second Flame Imp adds a good bit of pressure. Lightning Storm clears two of the minions, leaves the other two. Fungal Mancer comes down, go face. There's a 7-5 Happy Ghoul. Hunter Ace is able to, on his overloaded turn, Farsight into a Hex, but there's still a lot of pressure going down, and he's down to 15 life. And then 9 life the next turn, Sintelal draws Kalisith of his own. But Manatide's been going this whole time. And the second Lightning Storm comes down now. And then Life Drinker, the zoo's down to 17, the Shutter Rock goes up to 12, and then Electra Healing Rain... Ugh. Brings Hunter Ace back up to 30. And Sintelal top decks. Infused Keliseth doubling imp. That's two five fives. And then Serenite Chain Gang comes off the top, and Volcano leaves behind 5-3, five, 5-1, five, and 4-1. And they all get to attack. Soulfire off the top, and a life drinker. Now Hunter Ace is back at 3 life. Cleared the board. Double Lightning Storm. Double Healing Rain. Go back to 30, but now he's down to 3, 3 turns later. But then he top decks the rain, and he has the second volcano. He clears and heads back up to 15, and the mana tide totem is dead at this point. But he drew 7 extra cards off of it. 7 cards off the mana tide. But it's still not over. Since all top decks a 7-3 Leroy and taps into a doubling imp, and that's another attack for 7 and play 2-3-3s. Three, three, and Sintelal has used both healing... Or, uh, Hunter Ace has used both healing rains, both volcanoes, both lightning storms, and he's at 8 life. Is there a way to win? Is there even a way to survive? Well, there is. Because there's been no Glacial Shards, no Grumble, no Hagatha, but there has been a Life Drinker. So he plays the second one, hexes the Leroy, but before he hexes the Leroy, he goes face with the Whelps, and the Life Drinker puts Sintelal to 6. Two Life Drinkers played. Do you see where I'm going with this? There's a Shutter Walk in hand. And Sintelal sees it. And he leans back in his chair and he sighs. A very expressive player. And he taps and he gets a Soul Fire. And he can put Hunter Ace to 1. But not to 0. And Shutter Walk the following turn. Deals 6. And kills Sintelal. With no other combo pieces being played. It was really, really awesome to watch this game being... being navigated and choices being made by both players and it almost worked out for Sintelal was so so close and he only lost because of double healing rain one of which of those was doubled and double lightning storm and double volcano but maybe if that mana tide had died earlier those cards wouldn't have been there to bail out hunter race now Sintelal won that match and it was a fantastic five game set definitely worth your time watching but i think this game kind of illustrates the micro decisions that might not always be obvious in the aggro decks, as well as the control decks, Sintelal made some choices, and I think guided himself into both a suboptimal board state and managed it well after he got there. After he mismanaged his opponent's resources, he still stayed in the game for a really, really long time. It was one off lethal that final turn, despite all that removal and 36 life being gained. But the one decision that I think really lost him the game was letting Hunter Ace draw seven extra cards over seven turns, and it didn't work out for him. Check out the match. Really, really cool. And HCT APAC is next weekend, along with week six of HGG and DreamHack Montreal. A lot of good tournament play coming. A lot more hat story time, as Apple likes to call it. And uh, 
yeah, it's high level play. Did either of you get to watch any of the HET EU? So there's one thing that you didn't really hit on uh, as hard as I think I would, I, as I was surprised to see, but it looks like the majority of the tournament brought Druid and about a, a bit more than half of it brought Hunter, but then the top eight had eight Druid and seven Hunter, which is seems like a pretty strong showing for for Hunter in general. That just seems seems like a pretty uh, noticeable statistic, I would say, that Hunter was was doing so well. And obviously, it just seems like the uh, um, the anti control decks were uh, did very well in the top eight. I was not able to catch much tournament play uh, this weekend, but uh, definitely will be. I, I know Apex coming up, but I'll definitely be looking out for uh, the Americas HCT coming up in two weeks. Yeah, that's a really good catch on the statistics, and I agree. I, though those two archetypes were very well represented, overrepresented in many cases in the top eight, and Cube Hunter, I think, is just really, really strong and is able to pivot between anti-control and it can sometimes be fast enough to beat combo and it can sometimes be resilient enough against aggro. It kind of does a little bit of everything. But Druid does do everything. And three token, three Mali kind of shows that the de the archetype can go in different directions. And I wouldn't be surprised we see a resurgence of Tauntruid soon because it beats all the other Druids. So if you don't want to ban Druid, you play Tauntruid. And then you drew with their druid, especially in DreamHack Montreal this weekend, which is the last hero standing, because you know what you're playing. And it's one of the few formats where you're rewarded by not banning druid if you have taunt druid in your lineup. The other thing that stands out about statistics, I didn't mention yet, and I want to save this to the end. There were 348 decks submitted to the tournament. 168 had Giggling Inventor. 168. That's a lot. That is about half. And then combined, there were 77 Blood Knights and 69 Mossy Horrors each. So combine that, it is for every six Giggling Inventors, there were five anti-Giggles cards. Six to five. That's Thank you for this perfect segue. <laughs> so, Appa, do you think that has any relevant impact on the format? I'm, I'm sitting behind this gate. Wait. So this week, we're going to talk about the obvious elephant in the room, and that is not Stampy the Augmented Alec <laughs> that, that Hat and Bodicus get me to try and love. He's a cool elephant. I just I don't How like do him you, like that. Why, why don't you love him? He is great. He's just trying to he's just trying to give you some extra stuff, man. He's a great, great little play on turn three. We, we like turn three plays because we dagger on turn two. I, I had an elephant bumper and I can't find it now and I'm sad. Well, we're not talking about Stampy. We're talking about Giggling Inventor. And Giggling Inventor is probably... I put down here that it's probably the most efficient card in the game right now, pound for pound. And I think it's certainly the most efficient neutral minion. I would say it's not the most powerful neutral minion because I think that's just the Lich King. But aside from that, I think... Giggling Inventor kind of holds all the other gold medals right now. Yeah, but, uh, since Corridor Cooper got got the got the big gold nerf bet, <laughs> uh, I think uh, I think Giggles has it for for now. Bro, I'm gonna get so much dust when they nerf these things. <laughs> Anyways, because of Giggling Inventor's efficiency, we see a f a good amount of interesting cards that we're not used to seeing played opposite of it. And Blood Knight and Mozzie Horror are the two best examples. And I think the most popular ones for just card-for-card -card counters for, for Giggling Inventor. And because of its sheer efficiency, Giggling Inventor actually warps the format around it. Because you have to take it into consideration when you're deck building, regardless of your strategy is. If you're building an aggro deck, you pretty much have to have an answer to it on curve or you're going to get two for one or worse by just a single giggling inventor or it's just going to gain so much life 
so much virtual life that you can't really come back from a swing turn, the turn following. So you need to be playing cards like Blood Knight and Mossy Horror in your aggressive decks. Uh, and when you're playing Control, a lot of the times you're usually okay against Giggling Inventor, but you still like to have an out to it because it is kind of obnoxious. So Mossy Horror gets played in the slower control decks. And that's to clean up Giggling Inventor. It also has applications against other small minions. But Giggling Inventor isn't the sole topic of discussion for this week. The reaction required to be able to compete in a Giggling Inventor dominated meta actually opens up space for what I think the real villain of the format is to exert a pretty big amount of pressure. And that's Spreading Plague. And to kind of connect those two, because I know it might seem like a weird leap to go from Giggling Inventor's good, so Spreading Plague is the real problem. <laughs> and the reason I'm sa I say that is Spreading Plague is one of the single strongest cards in the game in the right matchups, and serviceable enough in the matchups where it's not good that you just jam two copies in every Druid deck without thinking about it. Every single Druid deck right now plays Double Spreading Plague, I've even seen Taunt Druid play Spreading Plague now. Against the slow matchups, you just don't play it. But against aggro, it's just so good that you you just need it on... You need to have two copies so you can draw it. Yeah, the big Druid decks are almost always Taunt Druid that have cut the Witching Hour Q package and added in Spreading Plague and other big things on the top end. Because the power of Spreading Plague means you make it to the big stuff. And at a certain point, you're just slam jamming giant minions so often that you're good enough against control that you're not looking for more than the basic recursion. You can not play Spreading Plague, but you can also, you cast if you need it, and Hadronox getting back a bunch of 1-5s in the matchups where you need it is fine. And otherwise, you just remove the hour cube package if you're looking for faster ramp and just more, more high end in general. Yeah, you remove the witching hour cube infinite inevitability, essentially, for... Break glass in case of aggro card. <laughs> and so while the rest of the of the meta has a necessity of counting countering giggling inventors pretty much in every game, like how they build their deck, you have to have answers for it. Druid doesn't really have that problem though. Not only does spreading plague one up giggling inventor on a straight up one for one basis, it also gets what I think is a pretty big meta buff because of the tech cards against giggling inventor. And I know we just talked about Mossy Horror, and Mossy Horror is good against Spreading Plague, but the decks that really need to beat Plague aren't really playing Mossy Horror, and I think Mossy Horror sees significantly less play than Blood Knights, because the decks that want to beat Giggling Inventor the most, just straight up one for one, are the aggressive decks, because they need to punch through it cleanly. And the control decks don't really need to. It's nice to be able to, but they don't build their deck and be like, what am I going to do about a giving inventor on five? A lot of the time, they'll just be like, okay, tank up, whatever, tank up. Okay, that's a giggling inventor. I'll deal with that in a little bit. But aggro, whenever it comes down, you need to be able to deal with it on demand. So the Blood Knights are really, really important. And a lot of the odd decks are playing two copies. The... Odd Paladin and Odd Rogue, I think the popular list are both playing two copies in there. And there is a Zoo deck playing Mossy Horror. That's kind of weird, but... Yeah. By kind Anyways. of weird, you mean finished Rank 1 Legend last season. Like, actually yes. finished Rank 1 Legend by playing a Mossy Horror. Yeah. It's, it's a weird world we live in. Where yeah, your aggro so deck just... needs more 6-mana 2-7s. Just draw your Keleseth first every time so that you make sure that your Serenite Chain Gangs and your Cobalt Librarians don't get hit by the Mossy Horror and you're fine. I yeah. see no issues with this. Or kill them on five. Yeah, that too. So the reason I'm bringing up Blood Knight and Mossy Horror is that the decks that used to play Void Rippers to counter Plagues now have two Blood Knights in that spot. So Spreading Plague doesn't have the straight up one for one answer the vast majority of the time against aggro, which is where it really needs Plague to stick. So whenever people are building aggressive decks now, since they're giving so much respect to Giggling Inventor because they have to, they pretty much have to seed matchups versus Druid. If you're building an aggressive deck, 
you're most likely just conceding your matchup against Druid because spreading plague is that good. It when you play it against aggro, you shut them down pretty severely if you're not really, really, really far behind in terms of development. And that's why I think a lot of aggressive strategies are actually not really being pushed out, but we're seeing a lot more aggressive strategies, I think, float less towards the top and why we're seeing so much druid towards the top of the high red legend ranks because spreading plague actually gets so much better due to the fact that giggling inventor is so popular because we go from void rippers to blood knights now that, that was kind of my yeah. thoughts on what what's happening and how much pressure both of these cards really are exerting on the meta uh, more so Giggling Inventor, because it's played in actually almost every deck. Well, so Spreading Plague, but Plague also exhibits a significant amount of pressure because you just can't really afford to have an answer to Giggling Inventor plus Plague unless you are a Mossy Horror deck, which a lot of decks aren't. Well, yeah, it... we're running into the best deck in the format right now by the numbers is Token Druid. Because it gets to play both those cards and, and abuse them. And the bill that has grown to popularity, mentioned in the chat here by Craptasm, is the Strong Shell Scavenger build. For those who don't remember, that's a Druid 4 mana 2 3 rare. Give your taunts plus 2 plus 2. Now, if you have a Giggling Inventor, and then you follow with a Strong Shell Scavenger, that's Fungal Mancer for one less mana. If you have a Spreading Plague, and you play a Strong Shell Scavenger, Mossy Horror doesn't kill it anymore. They stick around. And so if you don't soul the forest, instead you strong shell, strong shell scavenger, they don't give you a 2-2 back, they just give you a pile of 3-7s. In a lot of matchups, a pile of 3-7 taunts is by far good enough. You can also use branching pass to get out of attack range. You soul the forest to stick. The, the decks that are able to go wide and stay wide are really, really strong right now. And Token Druid, oddly enough, Beats Odd Warrior two thirds of the time. Because Odd Warrior can clear a board once. Clearing a board twice is very difficult. It's the same reason why Token Druid beats Big Spell Mage. Because it's inefficient board clears the deck deals really well with. It's efficient board clears that it doesn't deal well with, which is why Defile, not the card Token, Token Druid wants to see. But there aren't a lot of Defile decks out there, because there's so many decks that prey on the Defile decks. Yeah, whenever you're playing. Token Druid versus a slow matchup like that, like Big Spell Mage or Odd Warrior, you mostly want to save your Soul of the Forest to combo with your Wisps, because that way you force them to have two board clears in a turn, and if they don't, then you just threaten lethal with Savage Roars and Branching Paths that they pretty much always have to respect. But, yeah, that's... A, I, I think this whole Dexplanations kind of highlights some of the main reasons why token druid is so good right now. And I just think that plague and inventor are putting quite a significant amount of pressure on the format that they're kind of, I would say single handedly, but they're, I guess they're hand in hand. They're eliminating pretty much entire archetypes from existing. Like I would, I would love to play odd, odd hunter right now, but I just can't justify that in a world where we have odd warrior and druid that has plague and gains a million armor because if they didn't have plague and they just gained a bunch of armor then you could probably fight through that but when they gain armor behind a wall of one fives then you just lose it's the fact that you don't just have the one aggro killer on ladder with the warrior deck you have the aggro killer with warrior and then whatever archetype druid's playing that beats everything else, plus two cards that just wipe aggro by themselves. Yeah, I I don't really know how how this meta is, is working right now. I guess I guess largely because I haven't played it as much, but just the spreading plague has all always felt like a very weird 
safety valve on on the format to prevent aggro, which has traditionally in Hearthstone just been pretty much at what I would consider the best deck for a long for a long time, or at least extremely popular in every meta. And while it still finds its way to perform well, uh, the it's just kind of a weird the the combination of both giggling inventor and spreading plague just makes it feel very hard it, it feels impossible to want to play a go wide um a go wide aggressive deck it, it seems like all of the aggressive decks are that are doing well are forced to kind of go taller like i assume most of the odd paladins have are are more mech focused with war gear and then obviously um uh wow i forgot fungal mancer <laughs> well, you'd actually kind of be surprised. There's quite a few odd paladin builds that are doing pretty well that just aren't playing mechs. I think the theory there is just like, okay, going tall is better against like plague and stuff, but we're straight up trash against spreading plague anyways. Forget it. <laughs> just focus <laughs> on everything else. Yeah, I, I'm also, I was trying to think of a good way that I don't, a good way to express this, which I don't hear talked about a lot, but it's, I guess, actions during a turn being amount of attacks as a resource during a turn where Giggling Inventor puts a really big uh, a, or a lot of pressure on the amount of attacks you can make in a turn because it obviously soaks four. Yeah, board um, presence is the term I think you're looking for. Um, and, but I, I know what you're talking about in the ability to use an attack piecemeal. How many times have we played a cobalt scale band on five because we had nothing else and the board was empty? It's five mana, five, five. It's fine. Giggling Venner is that plus two divine shields, plus two, plus four taunt defensive attacks, plus three minions that can attack separately however they want. You just have so much more flexibility than a stat line that we were already playing. Now, we weren't ideally playing Cobalt Scale Bane on 5 on an empty board. Same way with Lothab. That had a very clear other effect, but it's a stat line that the game has seen quite a bit of being played in suboptimal circumstances. 5 mana for 5-5 five, five stats is slightly below the curve, but not by a lot. And now we just get a card that slows the game down, gives me diversity of attacks, huge board presence, plays with minion enablers like Fungal Mancer, which is in every single deck that plays Giggling Inventor. Almost all of them are playing it. And you get to just develop a board in a box. Board in your pocket. That's more than a card should really be able to do for that mana cost. Just a little bit too efficient. And it's not just an aggressive strategy that is good. Or not just in control. It's good in every strategy, right? I'm looking at Odd Paladin now. The list that finished Rank 1 Legend. Or, or is Rank 1 Legend uh, Turner's list that he tweeted uh, so far. It's just pretty standard. It does have double Blood Knight, does have double Maul, double Raid Leader. It has a Void Ripper, has one Giggles, not two. And it has Leroy to try and punch through. But Spreading Plague is one of those cards that's kind of just putting pressure on the format in a way that... (sighs) It prevents strategies that invest into the board in a... not in a very specific way at great risk, really, really great risk to invest in the board in a, in a in a particular way. And that is you can't go wide anymore. And you can't pressure by going wide anymore. The feeling I get on turn five whenever I say I need to trade off these fireflies and not play minions because my opponent might have plague feels wrong. Feels like I am playing around a card because I will get punished so badly by it that my core strategy needs to be immediately countered by myself. And I'm not saying the card is necessarily overpowered, but I'm saying the card feels like it is in the, it is in a class identity where you always beat Druid previously by making a wide board. It lost a zoo forever. And it still doesn't have a great zoo matchup, but it always got beaten down by imp gang bosses. And now it just feels like if you get stuck, you have to play Mossy Horror or Void Ripper or something to punch through in a way that feels limiting in a lot of ways for aggressive strategies. And... Here's where I think I'm worried about the meta. I'm going to read you two lists. The first list 
Zoo Warlock, Token Druid, Alaneth Mage, Odd Rogue, Odd Paladin, Secret Hunter, Cube Hunter, and Quest Rogue. The second list. Token Druid, Cube Hunter, Odd Warrior, Secret Hunter, Zoo Warlock, Odd Paladin, Even Warlock, Control Warlock. The first list is the meta at Legend. The second list is the meta at 1 through 4. The difference is unbelievable. Alanoth Mage is the third best performing deck at Legend. It is not on the chart in 1 through 4. There are three Warlocks in the above 50% in the 1 through 4 meta, two of which have Defile. None of those are on the Legend list, yet Zoo Warlock's the most popular deck. Quest Rogue is just barely outside 50% in the Legend ladder. It is the 10th deck on the 1 through 4 ladder. We have two different metas at once. Dictated entirely by skill, by precision of execution, and by meta choice. And that feels interesting and rewarding of skill, but also really punishing to play. I, I'm going to transition this topic a little bit. I have spent less time playing Hearthstone lately for a lot of reasons, some other distractions, some of which are game-related, some of which are not. And in the time I spent coming back, it feels so much less rewarding to deck switch and so much less rewarding to try and play a diverse meta as opposed to picking a deck, sticking with it, and learning it inside and out and learning all the other decks and each game plan. And that's very time-intensive and very labor-intensive, but I feel like if I don't do that, I'm at a severe disadvantage because the decks are just in different orders, but they all work differently based on what you're up against and how you play it. And it's been hard to stay enthusiastic about the game when the cap to perform at a reasonable level is so high in terms of time investment and experience and precision required. I want to play Hearthstone with less focus, with less time, and this meta doesn't feel conducive to that. It feels really rewarding to high skill and high time investment, but if I don't want to do that and don't want to play one deck and grind it, it doesn't feel good. I talked for a while. You guys talk. Yeah, there, there's a lot to be said about being a specific deck expert in this meta because you can get edges kind of all over the place just by knowing your matchups inside and out. And that takes a long time in this meta because there's so much diversity. Online classes are fairly strong. Some are stronger than others, but all are reasonably well represented. And you have to know how to play against all eight other classes. Well, all nine classes and multiple archetypes for each class. So it's, it can be, it can be a trying experience if you're not really zoned into just Hearthstone. If you're, if you just play Hearthstone as kind of a hobby on the side, then it can get kind of frustrating at a certain point. You're just like played against zoo like three games ago and playing against control warlock. Now I kept for zoo like this sucks you know, and you haven't like played that matchup a ton. So it's there, there is a lot to be said about kind of zoning in on a specific deck and learning it, but not everybody finds that too enjoyable. Like for me, I, I like kind of jumping around between decks, but each time I switch a deck, I'm just like, I feel like I'm in kindergarten again. <laughs> I don't know these matchups very well. I feel like I'm making mistakes all over the place. So it's it definitely doesn't feel like a meta for that's very conducive to sampling different stuff. Um, yeah, I'm probably just going to say the same thing over and over again until Bodicus takes this from me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just going to say that traditionally the metas where I've done well in have been the metas where there is one very dominant deck and it doesn't. I'm either usually playing that deck or playing a deck that counters it, but those metas I do I feel like I do well in because the amount of matchup knowledge is much more condensed and I can get a lot of knowledge by jamming a bunch of games in a shorter period of time and learn and learn quicker, but when you have a form a meta as wide and just kind of I guess random as we have as we have now the it, it's just much harder and I've found that every time I'm in the uh the the play screen where I'm choosing my deck selection screen it's really hard for me to choose a deck right now 
because it's it always feels like no matter what I'm queuing, I want to be queuing something else. So it's really hard, or it's been really hard for me to just click that play button with certainty that I'm playing a deck that I feel I feel confident in. And and that's kind of rough. I do like the the fact that this meta exists. I think there are people that thrive in metas like this and really enjoy that they can play any class and any deck. But this is just not um, not what I'm used to, and probably something I I just need to invest more time into or or need to figure out a better a better strategy. Because um, yeah, it's. I always have more fun when I'm winning, and it's the this meta is definitely harder to win, and for me at least. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> just I don't think. Play silence, chicken. I don't think just for you. No, it's, I had to click three buttons to talk uh, because I mute oh. the feed to you guys and I mute the feed to the patron. I, like, I don't think it's just you, and I don't mean to. to well, I do. I actively mean to divert this conversation, so I'm not going to say I don't. Um, <laughs> I, it's. Part of it might be we look at the list of decks that we're playing with here, and these are all last metas decks, almost all of them, that all got a mild upgrade. Zoo Warlock, it got uh, got Soul Infusion, got Solarium, got Doubling Imp. Token Druid got Giggling Inventor. Alanath Mage got, well, I guess it got Quest Rogue more than anything, but Stargazer Luna. <laughs> um, Odd Rogue got Giggling Inventor. Odd Paladin got Giggling Inventor. Secrets Hunter got Quest Rogue. I don't think it actually plays any other cards from the new set. I can't think of any. Cube Hunter. Secret plan? Uh, well, the Secret Hunter, the ag- the aggressive version, doesn't even play that. Oh. Spell Hunter does. Uh, but the Secret Hunter deck is the mid-range go-face deck. Subject 9, I guess, most of the time. Cube Hunter plays Giggling Inventor, and Quest Rogue has Giggling Inventor, and Control Warlock has Giggling Inventor, and even Warlock has Defile Targets. So we're looking at last meta... Plus a card or two. One of which in particular has influenced which decks get to stay at the top of the meta. And a bunch of other strategies that are generally not quite given enough resources or aren't competitive enough against what we have to keep the same decks from going in a circle. And really just choosing where in that circle you want to stop. And I do believe if you pick any of these decks... The variance you will get from playing against bad matchups is far outshined by how good you are with that deck and how good you are at winning when you're behind and unfavored polarized matchups. But doesn't mean it's enjoyable just because it's skill testing. And I'm having trouble staying interested in this meta despite it being objectively interesting. It is fluid, it is diverse, it is constantly changing, but I'm having trouble engaging with it. And I think there's something there. I've finished so, talking. You can go. <laughs> when we talk about the serious topics, there's so much silence. It's uh, it's weird. It's thought from provoking discussion. I gotta stop. Yeah. yeah, I think we're all we're all just kind of con- considering our our places in where we're at in, in this meta and trying to. I think we're all still trying to figure out where where we even go from here. I mean, uh, or I, at least I am. I've I've kind of gravitated from trying different archetypes. At the beginning, I was trying to stick to, I guess, aggressive archetypes and try and get good with Odd Rogue and Odd Paladin, but I just wasn't having fun with that. And I've been tuning Shutterwalk Shaman a lot because I think the popular list, like full combo Shutterwalk Shaman, not not Evolve Corridor Creeper shenanigans, because I feel like there's a lot of unexplored space within the archetype currently, which sounds weird. But I've I've been just trying different cards and stuff, and really trying to master that deck because it is it is pretty hard to play, and I think it's has some really good matchups in this meta, and that's kind of the one I've been sticking with that I've been enjoying a lot. So that's kind of how I settled down in this meta. I I, I come home from school every day, and I'm like, man, I just want to play some Shutterwalk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that's when I'm not Turbo Quest Odd Warrior. <laughs> I will say I'm I am looking forward to getting some sequential warrior on some uh, some sequence warrior um, though you know who wouldn't like that Fibonacci Fibonacci is very clearly not about sequential numbers so it's a Fibonacci 
the sequence is as deep yeah yeah as a deep joke um but so i'm looking forward well i'm doing what you're doing up i'm finding the fun in the game and hearthstone as a game is fun and it's the level that that i play it has i've gotten to the point where the level that i play hearthstone scales to the amount that it is capable of providing fun for me puzzles on the train as we've established and then also playing a deck that looks fun and interesting i saw the secret hunter deck i'm like i want to go face and I played it, and I jammed face, and I was like, this is awesome. And I played about two games a day or three games a day, and I was like, I'm mo- I'm winning more than I lose. Not always winning, but I win more than I lose, and the games are real fast. And then other times, I have a bit of a longer play session. I try a couple other things. I saw a cool even shaman deck. I want to give it a shot. Sure. But la- this time last month, new set magic, and I was playing like five hours of Hearthstone a day. Like, I just couldn't get enough of it. There were so many different decks to try, and then the decks that were good, even the established ones, were interesting and different. And this meta settled the way that second set metas seem to settle. Because maybe it's just a second set thing. The last one we had, Knights of the Frozen Throne, obviously had issues. The last one before that, One Night in Karazhan, obviously had issues. And before that, there weren't second sets yet. There weren't blocks. So I guess this is just a thing that three times in a row, the second set has stabilized an existing meta, but has not really created a new one. It's kind of interesting to think about. Man, I really want to go play some zero mana Raza Priest. Zero mana hero power Raza Priest right now. I really want you to not be able to do that. (laughs) I also enjoy doing broken things. (laughs) Yeah. Uh... Well, it's, I don't know, I... I don't even know where I'm going with this thought, but I've had tr- uh, like I've been looking at the numbers, and Hearthstone is it's fascinating to analyze, but I'm not engaging with playing it as much, and I'm trying to connect that because I see people on Twitter anecdotally that are kind of having the feeling of like not I hate this meta, I hate this game, but eh, they're just feeling super meh about it's it because eh. it's all, it's it's just more of the same, yeah, with a little little extra sprinkled on top, and that extra. Those sprinkles tasted good for the first month, and now we're tired of eating the same sprinkles. <laughs> we we, yeah. we want some different sprinkles well, on our ice cream. I wanted to die to Mechathune Priest way more often than I am. I wanted same. Demonic Project to be the card that was holding the format together. Instead, it's Mossy Horror and Spreading I wanted Plague. my opponents to play War Gear more than what they're playing. You wanted them to play War yeah. Gear more gear. When I edit the show, I'm leaving the silence in. Uh, I love that Oppa face so much. My I'm favorite just, I'm just face. staring at Hat's icon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't even get to see Hat's face during the during the show. It's bad. Imagine me looking unreasonably proud of myself. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine I, that face. Every, yeah, every time you make a pun, that's just the face I get already, so. Yep, that's... You've got it. You've got it locked in. Yeah, I think I think we can kind of cap off this discussion by saying if you're not enjoying where the meta is at right now and you're not one of those kinds of players that enjoys these types of metas, it's definitely important to find your fun in the game, whatever that is. If that's playing casual, doing puzzle modes or playing a bunch of arena. I've had metas where I just play a ton of arena more than constructed. Because I I haven't just enjoyed what was going on, and I it's just I think I think it's really important to find the fun if you're having difficulty like pressing play on ladder. You know, if you're just not finding yourself wanting to play ladder, don't play ladder. Play some other stuff. Just enjoy the game because it's it's a great game. It's an awesome game. Meta might stink to you. Meta might be awesome. Whatever the case is, just find your fun. So what I should have here is a Giggling Inventor sign out instead of Serenite. But I haven't done that yet, so we're just going to have Serenite. How long can this go on?
and we want to say thanks to a whole bunch of people. We do actually have a couple iTunes reviews that came in basically as of the time of this recording they populate. We're going to read that on our bonus episode on Monday, Discord Discussions, coming to a podcast near you. But first, want to say thanks to Stefan Nell for letting us use his cover. Check him out in his channel, link in our show notes. Big thanks to Hearthstone Top Decks and BeerBrick.com for decklists, and Hearthstone Tournaments on YouTube for tournament VODs. The show notes for this week's episodes are on our website, coinconceed.com. You can monetarily support our show at patreon.com slash coinconceed. Join us every week live by following us at Twitch at twitch.tv slash coinconceedpodcast. Join our community chats in our Discord at discord.coinconceed.com. Write into our email at coinconceed at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at coinconceed. If you'd like some CC swag, head on over to our shop at shop.coinconceed.com, a new shop coming at Dad Legend. We have one design now. We'll be porting over the rest in the coming weeks. We want to shout out Mid Game, our Listener League tournament admin, and we do actually have a Listener League. It's starting this weekend, so check it out. Listener League, it's coming. It's last year's standing format. It is a joint podcast project between a Coin Concede and a Velen's Chosen because we like them over there. We like Rob, we like Grant, we like Eve. They're all good people. And the Velen Chosen Discord and the Coin Concede Discord have a lot of connections, so we want to make sure we're all in this together. Very friendly environment. Competitive but not cutthroat, and you will probably spend just as much time talking to your opponent after the game than before. Lots of people collaboratively working in their lineups. Definitely check it out. Good way to get a feel for what tournament play is like in our Discord is the best way to engage with it. Big thanks to our producers, Viriatus and Arrow, who is now known as Tacos. And... I had tacos for dinner. It, they were delicious. Oh, man, now I want tacos. I actually had tacos for dinner, too. I kind of forgot, because we had an early dinner. I picked Taylor up, and we went to this place. We, we went to El Paso, and I got fish tacos. Picked her, <laughs> picked her up my sweet new rental car. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Yeah, your automotive situation has been um, interesting. It's been it's interesting. It's been, I haven't used my, my bleep in a while, so it's been straight up bullshit. Marking that down. Um, <laughs> see, mine was on peanut butter. Yours on something similarly important. Um, you know what? Go ahead and say when you're coin conceit. I don't think it's going to get better than this. Okay, so my coin conceit is actually going to be to hat for setting up a GoFundMe because Taylor totaled her car. I believe it's three weeks ago now. She was in an unfortunate accident. Car got totaled, and then we were driving around in my car. And I was on my way to work Thursday, and this person was going at this traffic circle, and then I looked to the left to check for traffic, and I started accelerating because she was accelerating real fast. And then I turned back around, and there was a car in my face, and my hood was crumpling into the back of her car. <laughs> And my my car was a 1999 Oldsmobile Cutlass with 150,000 miles on it. So I believe the Kelly Blue Book on that is legitimately $300. So rip that. The so edge of that Cutlass that. has unfortunately dulled a bit. Yeah. we. Uh, so we're without a car. We're using a rental for, I think, another week and a half-ish. But Hat set up a GoFundMe because he's a gigantic sweetheart. He's a big old sweetheart. The largest of elderly sweethearts and a lot of great people have already donated. And I, I just appreciate that a lot. So I, I wanted to shout out hat and everybody who's donated. Let me actually pull up the list so far because I want to thank everybody individually. So thanking hat beef squatch anonymous, Ryan Luby, Steve Lubitz, w- wicked good, Scott King, Matthew Myers, Liz peace, smiley, Chris and Mark Sheriff. Y'all are all fantastic, and I do appreciate that a lot because we will, we we will need a car in about a week and a half. So, yeah, my my last week was not very good in terms of real life things, but I did have Hearthstone had the podcast to look forward to. So, I, I also want to give a shout out actually to everybody in the Serious Talk channel in our Discord because I had just the actual worst week I think I've had probably ever and just just venting in there helped a lot our, our discord community is fantastic hearthstone community is fantastic so who in the hearthstone community do you want to give your coin can see to hat there's a bunch of people i want to give a coin can see to druids that lack any type of burst whatsoever specifically big druid i don't think that they can do a point of damage from hand just shout out to them um Bodicus, I see you. I'm, I'm anticipating. 
Yeah, well, I was I'm waiting for my coin concede before we before we get into into this burst druid discussion. Yep. Just want to get ahead of it and just say non burst druids need love too. <laughs> I want to give a coin concede to Wicked Good. His decklist browser is rapidly becoming the most used tool we uh, use to prep for this show. And it is very, very convenient and easy to use and very pretty and full of data, which I could spend hours upon hours dealing with. And I asked him for help putting a filter in, and it took him approximately 45 seconds while I was adding the show notes. So props to Wicked Good for being a good data person and a good friend. Props to Spivey over in 1600 Dust and the Guild. We are working on starting over on Daggerspine. Uh, we mentioned it last week, but it's got quite a few people in there now. So if you are new to WoW, uh, we're definitely, me and Botix are definitely more involved socially than in-game because we've got quite a few things going on in our main guild and in our, you know, Hearthstone podcast, the thing you're listening to right now. We do that too. Um, but we are definitely socially involved and more than happy to do some crossover play. And my THL team, the pod people, including Chris, the other host from 1600 Dust, well, one of the other three, uh, and Zeroshio from Hero Power, and Dyrus Bear from, I think he's still on Brewmasters and he was on the clock, and Mojo Powell, who's not on a podcast, and Toku NJT, who's not on a podcast. Yeah, we're the pod people. We all do podcasts. So props to my team. We won, took him down first week, proved Rubobson wrong because he called us a dumpster fire, and, uh, and we showed him. So pod people come to get you. Yeah. If there's anything I've learned, it's don't listen to Rebobson when he talks about opinions that he has. Unless they're about Odd Warrior, <laughs> in which case you should probably yeah. listen. Yeah, that one. But especially if he talks about bringing patches back. Uh, that was just the most nonsense uh, we've ever seen. Okay. Uh, either way, let's get into my coin concede, which is to Fino, who posted this list, and it's beautiful. He calls it just good, and it is a burst druid list. It's missing a couple key cards in it, I will admit. <laughs> missing some key the, players here. It doesn't have the Mukla in it, which makes me a little sad, and mm. also the best card in burst druid, which is obviously Cairn. There's going to be a uh, point where episodes but... <laughs> are just callbacks to previous episodes, and we don't actually have time for new content. Like, the bonus episodes okay. are going to be where we talk about that. I think it's okay to just have... <laughs> our coin concedes beat a King Mukla. Yeah. And we're gonna, our Lord and Savior Cairn every week. We're going to rename our show to Mukla Cairn to Arms and just straight memes. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm glad that I can bring all of the memes to, <laughs> to coin concede. I don't know if there was a, enough of them before, before I joined. But clearly not anyway, because this... they keep getting added. <laughs> But uh, this li this list is very similar to something I played around with uh, when the set first came out, and I'm definitely going to try it again. Uh, I I've heard a lot of people playing something similar without the Cult Master, but that seems like a fairly interesting inclusion. So we'll see. But obvi obviously, when I see a burst druid list, I got I got to check it out. <laughs> I love how we're not even calling it aggro anymore. It's just burst. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> and and this deck, you're you're forgetting this is a mech druid. There are two explodinators in this deck. That's not what it's called. Yeah, yeah. it's called <laughs> I mean, burst. No, it's, my, my, it's called just my burst a... druid deck. Ha my burst druid deck had two explodinators too. So what are you talking about, Hat? Uh, clearly, you know, I must not really know alone. the you archetypal know really definition. You know what's really good with bursting when you got Savage Roar with the explodinator and they're bursting all over your opponent's face for two damage. I'm going to edit that phrasing really <laughs> significantly. <laughs> and the patrons, this is, <laughs> this is a tier five level episode. <laughs> patrons, I'm sorry. I'm going to post a warning. Don't listen to this around your kids. <sighs> Body is over here bursting on people's faces. What are you doing, man? It's you not even midnight. You need to put in there, man. Just throw some bananas in there, too, oh, while you're at it. I will, I will just end the show. I will play the outro right now. <laughs> oh my god <sighs> that, that's a uh, that's our tier five their tier that's, five corner i i've marked this particular section i think 19 times to make sure i just <laughs> never forget cutting it all out <laughs> it's it's just gonna look like swiss cheese
We were a safe for work <laughs> podcast once. That happened once upon a time. Oh no, I'm crying. Oh. All right. So well, you can gonna... follow me on Twitter. I'm <laughs> at BotkusHS for more Burst Druid related posts. I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, Appa, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Appa underscore HS on Twitch TV at. Why did I just say Twitch? Okay, whatever. On Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash ophs or at Into the Wild because I'm casting that league, the games that Taylor isn't playing because she sits four feet four feet to the left of me. And I think I'm going to cast a bit of UHL this year or this season as well. So you can find me in those two places and in Discord in most Hearthstone Discords. How about you, Hat? Where, where can people find you? Find me on Twitter at Ridiculous Hat. Find me on Twitch, twitch.tv slash Ridiculous Hat, and any Discords where Hearthstone is discussed. And uh, I will be streaming tomorrow night, Thursday at midnight. It'll be past that by the time the cast. And we will be live building and playing Sequence Taunt. So tune in. Definitely the first thing we were doing on stream. Are it's you actually building Sequence Taunt? 100% doing what I said. Doing it yes. live. The first thing we were doing... Is cracking open a cold, refreshing Pabst Blue Ribbon and just typing the word taunt and just going in order. Look, whenever you hit legend with it and you post about it on Twitter and it goes on Beer Brick, just tag me in the Twitter, in the Twitter post. That's I like I the world that you live in and someday I hope to get there. <laughs> so keep calm and sequence on. And if you see us on the ladder, Appa, you go ahead. Coin concede. Coin concede. Coin concede. Take cold comfort in your victory. You win. I can rest now. This time, this hunt is yours.